Well, good morning, everybody. We all tend to have, uh, let's call them mental maps, uh, particularly for places that we, uh, we've we been for a long time. So you might think of uh, your childhood home, if you were there for an extended period of time. Uh, some of us are like uh, elementary school or middle school, and I bet if I invited you for like 30 seconds just to close your eyes, you could kind of drift away to that place right? Uh, you kind of remember uh, what was going on at the stage of your life when you were in those significant spots. And I bet, again, if I gave you uh, enough time, you could get to these places in your childhood home or your middle school where it's like, uh, I remember where I was when, you know, you kind of fill in the blank, right? When something significant happens. Well, I have one of those with uh, my, uh, the church that we were part of growing up. So growing up at a time when not only was church kind of the normative assumption, just everybody went, but it was kind of the like um, uh, cultural hangout in the city. So, you know, our church had a gym and, you know, the, the, the boys would hang, play ball there throughout the week. And, you know, it was, it was just kind of the cultural epicenter. So I was in the church a ton. And uh, I remember the spot, uh, this is odd, but you know, it's, it's like uh, right outside the men's bathroom, but uh, right outside the men's bathroom in the church growing up was a, a hallway that led to the choir room on one side, and on the other side was the office for the music pastor. And um, some churches like uh, like ours have really weird music pastors, like Walker, but uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, our church growing up had a really great one. Like, he was my parents' age. Uh, he was just a good dude. And the church just, you know, every people that were influenced by him, people that were shaped, we loved when this brother was leading. He was the best. He played a shaping role in the lives of many of, of us in the church. And what was jarring to me about this morning, standing outside the men's restroom, was I looked to his office and it was totally empty. Last week, when I was there, not there throughout, uh, it was filled with all his stuff. And then seemingly overnight, all of his stuff was gone. I must have been staring at his office because a buddy of mine walked up and said, have you heard? And I hadn't, but I did. Years of affairs, marriage over, fired from the church, gone. To, to, say, to say that I was heartbroken is an understatement. Um, it's been 30 years, and as you can tell, um, think about it long enough, and I, I can still feel that, that response. I can, I can still see the empty office. What I didn't know at that time was that that experience was going to begin uh, something of a, what is now four decade long pattern for me of the failure of many of those that I looked up to, many that I learned from, pastors that I served under, people who were instrumental in my spiritual journey, Groomsmen in my wedding, PhD supervisors, done. And my guess is I'm not the only one who's been there. I've been there so often and so much recently that the question, did you hear what happened to, man, I hate it because I know what's coming on the other end of that. So, did you hear what happened to Solomon? His story is the story. Let's start in the second half of verse four. Second half of verse four from what Heidi just read. Verse four, we would call this part B, and all of verse six provide a summary statement of the entirety of this chapter. We'll only go up through about verse 40, but this is kind of the the blanket. It's the conclusion of Solomon's life. Part B of verse 4, he being Solomon, was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, as his father David has been. Then in verse 6, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. So Solomon's life 
uh, works a bit like a roller coaster, but not the way we typically use the roller coaster imagery. It's not like twist and turns, but it's like the the roller coaster. You know, um, when you're when you're setting up to get on the big ride, and it starts by by creeping up the hill. You know, slow. It's methodical. You can hear the you know things clacking under you. You're taking in the thrills. You're talking to your kids beside you, and it takes forever. And then in a moment, it just comes crashing down. Two minutes to get up a hill, gone in five seconds. It's fun when you're on a roller coaster. It's horrific when it's the story of your life. Look towards the end of chapter 11. Look in verse 41. I mean, if we're telling this story, see a, an editorial header in your Bible that says Solomon's death. That's where this chapter is going to end. I mean, isn't that stunningly quick? as we've been telling this story. We've moved along fairly nicely up to this point. Solomon's done a lot of good. He's built a temple. This is his life's work. This is what the Lord had purpose that he would do. He's living in a glorious palace. We've seen him offer sacrifices to, to Yahweh, to the, to the true God. He's been blessed by God. He has supernatural wisdom. He has all the wealth that one could want. Such that in last week's text, the kings and queens of the whole world are coming to hear this man's words and see his wealth. The kingdom is at peace. They are anchored in as a dominant world power. Solomon has been a king's king. But it all comes crashing down for him in less than one chapter in our Bibles. And the phrases are, you know, they kind of, they differ in four and six. But what's consistent, Solomon was not faithful to the commitment that he made to the Lord. He did evil, or would say, he didn't finish well. Which, this is the, the blanket over, and this is where I want to exhort you, church, and exhort myself as the one preaching this. Finishing well is not a foregone conclusion. Finishing well, or we could supplement faithfully, is not a foregone conclusion. And it truly does not matter who you are. Like, I think this is the point the last decade of my life has shown. It really, whether you're one of the trifecta of kings of Israel, whether you're a prominent pastor or leader, whether you're a faithful spouse or parent, whether you're a lifelong Christian, there is an ever-present ever present danger that you can torpedo your life and legacy in an instant. And so here I want to thread a needle with 1 Kings 11 for us in what is definitely a heavy passage. When we see these stories of people that end finishing poorly, I think there are two unhelpful ways that we can respond. And I've seen both of these play out in my heart, and I'm tempted to them as we consider 1 Kings 11. The, the first response to the failure of prominent leaders, figures in the Bible, is just bitter cynicism. You ever been there? You just become a cynic. Man, if a person like this, you fill in the blank of who your this is, if they can blow up their life, what hope is there for any of us? No one can be trusted anyway. You might imagine some of the Israelites living through the reigns of these kings, hearing these stories, just shaking their head in despair by the time we get to this point, right? I mean, here we go again. Another leader blowing it. Later Israelites reading these stories while in exile, which is likely when these stories were constructed, saying, man, we're doomed. If Solomon, that leader, can't get his act together, what hope is there for any of us? And so here's what happens to the heart of the bitter cynic. You find yourself just questioning everyone and everything, Right? You don't give people a chance or the benefit of the doubt because you've been hurt before. You live with an air of suspicion about everyone and everything. The modern cancel culture tends to be the way you move through life, writing people off and doubting if anybody is actually who they, says, who they say they are. A word of caution to the bitter cynics among us as we come to this story. First, this is just a really terrible way to live. Being a bitter cynic and trusting no one is a terrible way to move through life. 
The root of bitterness, Hebrews 12, the root of bitterness will entangle your soul and it will rob you of joy and love. And you will not like the person that you will become. Secondly, bitter cynicism of others often doesn't take into account our own hypocrisy, does it? The sin nature that we inherited from our first parent is a universal foe. And even this side of salvation through Christ Jesus, sin still easily entangles. So to borrow Jesus' words, it's easy to hyper-focus on the speck in our brother's eye and miss the log that is hanging out of our own. Many times, a cynical heart dwells in the soul of a prideful person. It can never happen to me. And finally, while failure is universal, failure is not always final. Notice in our passage this morning, in 4 and 6, there's a contrast drawn. And I think this is instructive for us. The, the narrator says, notice, Solomon's different than David. Well, how so? I mean, David failed repeatedly. Some might argue more egregiously than Solomon did. And yet, though David wasn't perfect, his life was not defined by his sinful actions. David's sin did not have the final word. He was a man marked by repentance and restoration to the Lord and not marked by apostasy the way Solomon will be. So David, in contrast to Solomon, though not perfect, ran the race to the finish with integrity because he was a repenter. There are other worthy examples of this reality. Consider this from 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7 uh, into verse 8. This is the way Paul summarizes his life. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time for my departure is close. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. There's reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who loved his appearing. So notice what Paul can say at the end of his life. I finished faithfully. And not only did I finish faithfully, but there are others that are doing the same. So he can testify that he's kept the faith like a faithful martyr. I think this is the example Paul's drawing from. Paul demonstrates a faithful finish that is possible by the power of God's spirit. We all don't have to go the way of Solomon. But there's another even more beautiful example. This is taken from Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Remember the way that prayer starts is Jesus talking to the Father before uh, the, 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 the passion will play out. The hours come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you gave him authority over all people and have given life, eternal life, to everyone you have given him. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I've glorified you on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. What a beautiful summary statement on a life well lived, verse 4. I've glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This prayer and the truth it professes sets Jesus apart from kings of old. He perfectly glorified the Father on earth. He did exactly what the Father asked him to do. The Son finished the race well. And he did so without a stain of sin, with a perfect track record of faithfulness. Which is why the author of Hebrews and the passage that was read to us in our opening reflections from Hebrews 12 will exhort us, and notice the connection here. Because we've got a great cloud of witnesses, let us side every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run in here. Let us run with endurance the race that's marked out for us. Or I think we can synonymously say, let us finish well. Let us finish well. Whatever race is marked out for us, how? Verse 2, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Want to finish well? Look to Jesus. His death not only provides the, the payment for the wages of your sin, but his resurrection provides the power for you to fight sin. 
Want to avoid becoming a bitter cynic? Don't base your faith on the frail failings of the feeble, but base it on the faultless finish of our faithful king. Don't base your confidence in your life on the frail failings of people like Solomon, but base it on the faultless finish of our faithful king who ran the race that was marked out for him. Which brings us back to our responses. So one ditch is just to become a cynic. But there's another response, an equally unhelpful path. And I want to use the remainder of of our time this morning in 1 Kings 11 to caution us against this path. And it's the path of sloppy carelessness. The path of sloppy carelessness. It goes something like this. Just going to throw my hands in there. Why does it even matter? Why does it, if everyone's a mess and people that are way more put together than me are a mess, why should I even bother about caring about righteousness and holiness and obedience to the Lord? I mean, if the dude who is the wealthiest and wisest man to ever live crashes this way, then what hope is there for somebody like me? What happens then is a repeat performance of those who fail to finish well, isn't it? You just check out. And my guess is some 20% of you that are listening this morning, this is you. You've checked out. You've still got enough kind of religious heritage to show up at church on Sunday, but emotionally, your heart's long gone. This is just performative for you. So all the good that you could do, all that you could invest in your church, the neighbors and friends you could love and serve, it just goes out the window. You just sleepwalk through the third and fourth quarter of your life, which is why um, if you go to many senior adult ministries of area churches, you find people who are sluggish in their spirituality, right? They've just checked out long ago. They're just going through the motions. And you squander the years that you actually have the wisdom and ability to lead. Others follow Solomon's example down a path of waywardness. Here's how Paul is going to cast this and frame how we should engage in stories like Solomon's. Consider this from Romans 15, verse 4. Whatever was written in the past was written for your instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. This is what I want the sermon to do for you this morning. I wanted to give you hope and encouragement that you can finish well, that you don't have to run Solomon's path. So we don't read these stories, we don't roll our eyes, but we say, God, what would you have here for me to help me avoid Solomon's negative example? And what God has for us is an illustration from Solomon's life that begins in verse 1 that was read for us earlier, King Solomon loving many foreign women in addition to all, uh, in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 3, he had 700 wives who were princesses, 300 who were concubines, and they turned his heart away. When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord our God. So if there was a dad joke category for pastors, uh, there have been innumerable ill-timed jokes made about verse 3, right? I mean, how many of you have heard jokes about the difficulty of marrying one woman versus marrying a thousand, right? Right? It's a bad joke because the content is placed in one of the most heart-wrenching stories in all the scriptures, right? Like 16 tons of gold from last week. Uh, some, this is just a silly exaggeration. A thousand wives? Who, who does that? But it's presented here as fact. Solomon did, in fact, have a thousand wives. And what's not stunning, really, is, is that this would be a normative cultural practice, not to that extent, but he's stepping into a cultural norm. Not any Israelite, but a wealthy and wise king could have whatever he wanted. And apparently Solomon had quite the appetite for women. And not just any women, but women among the nations. 
And we've got to be careful here that the exhortation isn't to avoid what would be like interracial dating or marriage today. That's not the application of this text. Rather, the Lord has been exceedingly clear that to marry among the nations means that you are putting yourself in a position to worship the gods of the nations. This is far more a caution against a believer marrying a non-believer than it is a caution against any form of what we would call interracial dating or marriage today. Because for a believer to marry a non-believer, there's a temptation that you would be pulled away to worship their gods, the gods of secularism or the like of today. Back in Deuteronomy 7, this warning was given. God saw this coming. When the Lord your God delivers them, the nations, over to you, you defeat them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. You must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters to your sons because they will, and notice the emphatic nature of this claim, they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will swiftly destroy you. Instead, this is what you are to do to them. You tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, cut down their asherah poles, burn their carved images. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. So God's commands here are not arbitrary. They're for the good of the Israelites. And specifically, I mean, the predating, they're for Solomon's good. He just didn't see it that way. And so Solomon did what he wanted. And the Lord's warning plays out in this connection. Look again at verse 2. Notice, notice the language here. Nations about which the Israelites, you're told not to intermarry with them. And then notice the because clause here. Because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. Then again in verse 4, those that you're deeply attached to, these wives, will turn your heart away to follow other gods. The language of verse 2, deeply attached to, um, more kind of woodenly it's translated, uh, those that he clung to. Those that he clung to in love. So Solomon clings to these women, and what he clings to directs his heart which gives us kind of a, a pointer, some, some, some counsel, some instructive guidance. What your loves will lead you. Your, your loves will lead you. Or, or said more, more specifically to, this, to the language here, what you cling to will change you. It will direct you. So maybe an inverse relationship, we think, well, our hearts come first and they direct our loves. This is really only true if we think about love primarily in terms of feelings. If love is an action, then the opposite is true. What we love, what we choose to give ourselves to, what we cling to, then directs the course of our, our lives. So Solomon chose to cling to what the Lord had said was off limits. And there was a specific connection that those loves turned his heart away from the Lord. Now, we not want to make the entire application here related to sexual sin. Um, since, I mean, you can cling to all sorts of aberrant practices that are going to turn your heart away. But I also don't want to be naive, so naive to, to not notice the close link between sexual immorality and the failure to finish well. This has always been true, but it's really worth giving attention to in our age of ever-present forms of sexual rebellion. Whether it be pornography, coarse joking, so-called innocent exchanges with a coworker, quote finger, no fault divorce, extramarital perversion, what you cling to will change you. It's a rule. You may not offer incense on high places, but you will create your own forms of worship on your own created high places. 
and given enough time, you will do what is detestable to the Lord. Over time, you'll become the person you never thought you'd be, and you'll leave a tragic lineage of destruction. If this is you, please heed the example from the text this morning. Bring your sin into the light of God's mercy and forgiveness offered through Christ. Find hope and help to change before your sin changes you. Secondly, you have what you need. Your loves will lead you. Secondly, you have what you need. Here's what I mean by that. Look in verse 9. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord's God. It said five times in this passage, hearts turned away. The God of Israel who had appeared to him twice, he had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods. But Solomon did not do what the Lord had commanded. Look there, at the end of nine and twice in 10, there's the repeat performance. I told you so, right? Now, we're all resistant to that premise. Perhaps we heard it too much as kids or teens growing up, right? I told you so can fall flat on us. But this is exactly what the Lord is doing. He's saying to Solomon, this is, I told you, I appeared to you twice and I told you, I commanded you not to do the very thing that you have now multiplied a thousand times over. And there's a direct line drawn in verse 10. I commanded you and you did not do what I commanded. We can tend to make things overly complex, but here, this is just really simple. I commanded and you didn't do it. And now you're suffering the implications of, of your disobedience. And this is an example, friends. I mean, we can spin this negatively, but this is sweet kindness from the Lord. Imagine the opposite pattern. If God knew the things that would bring us harm and he just kept his mouth shut. Uh, he did a little bit of, you're going to have to learn by finding it out yourself. He bit his tongue. I mean, he's got full right to do this. But consider the grace of God to reveal to you the path of life. Consider the grace of God to give you holy scriptures that instruct you of, of what's best. Consider the kindness of God to stoop to your level to tell you how you might obey him. The psalmist says it beautifully, Psalm 16, 11. You have revealed the paths of life to me. What beautiful kindness from the Lord. He goes before you, carves out the path on the, you know, the hiking trail. He doesn't make you go through the thorns and thistles on your own, but he, he clears the way, as it were, and says, walk here. This is the path to joy and fullness. So what's on display in our passage this morning, what's on display, I would argue, in the totality of the scriptures is God is way smarter than you. He knows what's best. His commands are not arbitrary. He really does love you so much that he wants to warn you of harm you might not be able to see. And this is the abundance of examples in the Bible, like 1 Kings 11. They're meant to protect us from the sentiment, it won't happen to me. I can know the good I should do, and I cannot do it, and I'm going to be okay. And friends, I think there are compounding implications for those of us who live at a time and place when God's word is available and made clear to us. We have the mirror of God's word held up to us so regularly. We can see and turn from our sin. See this as kindness from the Lord. I think this is an important way to think about God's saving work in your life as a Christian. Often when we talk about salvation, or at least the, the category I had growing up, salvation was eternal. Something God was going to do for, he saves me from the eternal consequences of my sin, and he grants me life with him forever. But notice how Paul speaks of salvation in 1 Corinthians 15. I, I want to tell you about the, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you've taken a stand, and by which you are being saved present tense reality. You will be saved 
and you are being saved by the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his spirit in you. God, Christian, God saved you and he is saving you presently. And one of the means by which he is saving you is giving clarity of your sin and giving you the grace to repent, to turn from it. There's one final lesson for us here in our text, and it gets an unusual amount of, um, of words in the passage. And it's really largely because the narrator is wanting to introduce you to the character that's going to play the rest of the story, uh, the one who's going to come, that's going to kind of act this out. Notice the promise in verse 11. I'll reread since it's been a minute since Heidi read this. The Lord said to Solomon, since you've done this, since you did not keep my covenants and my statutes, which I commanded you, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you, and I'm going to give it to your servant. However, I will not do it during your lifetime for the sake of your father David. Tear it out of your son's hands. Yet I will not tear the entire kingdom away from him. I'll give him one tribe to your son for your sake of your servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem that I choose. So God's going to be faithful. He's going to be faithful to the promise that he made to establish David's kingdom, but it's now going to be a fractured kingdom. And this is why starting in chapter 12 of this story and going, if you've ever tried to do a read through the Bible in a year plan, it gets super complicated because the kingdom's getting ready to fracture and made two dominant pieces, but like a zillion tributaries. It's going to go, it's going to go crazy. Solomon's son is going to continue to rule over one of those tribes of Israel, but the rest are going to be torn away, taken away. This is both a gift. God's going to continue to show faithful love. He's not going to take the kingdom away entirely. He's still going to still be true to his promises, but it is surely a curse too. His gift and curse. I mean, imagine hearing this. The kingdom, is, not only are you not going to be it, but your son isn't going to be it. It's going to one of your servants. I mean, imagine the shame that comes from bearing the weight of that reality. I mean, it's totally humiliating. And what follows is instructive. In verses 14 and following, notice the, the narrator is going to take you all the way back. You could read this this afternoon. So take you all the way back to David and say, since David, these kings have been toying with the nations. They've not, they, they've, they've not eliminated them. They've made alliances. They've made treaties. They've forced some of them into to slave labor. And Solomon, you're continuing to, to multiply this pattern. And so what you've been toying with is getting ready to bite you. you. I mean, surely all seen the videos at some point, right? Dude's playing with the snake, right? Creating his little Instagram reel, and then the snake snaps, right? Uh, you know, taking a selfie with a sleeping crocodile, then it springs into action, you're done, right? Mess around long enough and you will get got. And friends, the same is true for us. The same is true. And God chooses to expose this sin, them toying with the nations, by raising up one of Solomon's servants. The guy isn't from the nations, Jeroboam, that's going to follow the... But he's not from David's line either. He's a servant. Basically, Solomon does to this servant what uh, uh, the, the nation as a whole has been doing to the rival nations. Sees this man, look in verse 28. The man, Jeroboam, was capable. Solomon noticed the young man because he was getting things done. What a means of choosing to appoint someone. He appointed him over the entire labor force of the house of Joseph. There's the irony there. We've got a Joseph of old who was elevated to a position of power and prominence, don't we? Pharaoh's court. But here Solomon elevates the wrong dude. And it is this wrong dude who takes a leadership and strips the kingdom away. Concludes, I did this, verse 33, because you've abandoned me. You bowed down to the Ashereth, to the goddess of the Stonians, to Chemosh, to the god of Moab, to Mount Milcom, god of the Ammonites. 
They've not walked in my ways, done what is right in my sight to carry out my statutes and my judgments as my father David did. did. Verse 39, I'm going to humble David's descendants because of their unfaithfulness. I'm not going to do it forever. So notice this drip of gospel grace seated in here. I'm not going to do it forever. Therefore, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but he fled to Egypt, and he remained there in, until Solomon's death. Last principle for us. You will reap what you sow. Your loves will lead you. You have what you need. God has given you his clear instruction, and you will. There, there is a definitive reality to the, to the principle of reaping and sowing. It's interesting, isn't it? Solomon has been toying with these divided loyalties. He's built for the Lord the temple, and he's worshiped the gods of the nations. And now, like, the, the summary statement on his rule will be a divided kingdom. A divided heart ruling over a divided kingdom. He's coming to reap what he has been sowing. In the New Testament, Paul makes the point this way. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap discussion, uh, destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. The, the, the initial statement, don't be deceived. There's a law of the universe at work here. You're going to reap what you sow. In our text this morning in 1 Kings 11, it took a really long time for that to come to pass, didn't it? Uh, the timestamp in the previous text tells us we got at least 20 years between Solomon building the temple and the nation collapsing. 20, 20, and, and up until that time, I think if you ask people among the nations, they would, Solomon's a good king. He's established peace. He's wealthy and famous. He's outwardly build, building up, but inwardly he's rotting. He rots from the inside out. And it takes some 20 years for the dry rot to be visible. And here's what I would imagine. If we knew the full story of those who torpedo their lives, their marriages, their Christian witness, my guess is we would find the same to be true for them. Patterns of sowing to sin in their 20s and 30s that were masked behind capability, giftedness, power, and position. And their soul dried up. They coddled sin, and it ultimately destroyed them. Fast forward 20, 30 years, and the rot is exposed, and people on the outside looking in say, no one saw this coming. But presumably, if you had the proper vantage point to observe their life, say, 20 years earlier, you would see that secret sin coddled in darkness was, given enough time, going to be brought into light. Friends, we who are in Christ have through Christ and the power of the Spirit all that we need to fight sin and pursue holiness. So two reflection questions for us this morning as we close. Two reflection questions. What are you sowing right now? If the law of the universe is true and you're going to reap what you get, what are you putting in the ground? And then this question's ruminated in my soul all week. Like, in 10 years... Will you be pleased if you reap the harvest of your current habits? If your current habits play out over, say, the next decade, are you going to like the person that you become? I'm going to invite the band to, to come on uh, to the stage now, and uh, we're going to have our kind of common time, a couple minutes of reflection. And I would love for you to ask the Spirit to press you in regards to your current patterns, your current habits, what you're sowing to right now, what you're loving, what you're clinging to in love, and ask God to give you the grace to repent. We don't do it consistently, but man, if you want to use space to kneel before the Lord, like by all means, like um, 
uh, use that, talk to us. I mean, whatever, however the spirit is pressing you, don't walk out and just say like, I can continue this same pattern and sooner or later I'll get around to it. But see this as a means of God's grace to press you this morning. So let's take a couple of minutes to pray silently and then I'll lead us in a prayer and then we'll, we'll sing to close. Our Father, we thank you for the great grace that is ours to be able to learn from the negative examples of those who've gone before. We thank you that not only can we learn from those who failed to finish well in our own lives, mentors, pastors, friends, parents, um, but we have your authoritative word that reveals to us this consistent pattern um, of hearts being pulled away from wholehearted devotion to you. Pray particularly this morning over the senior saints among us, those with decades of exposure to your word and your truth, Pray that you would raise up men and women in that, that subset of our body who would, would be faithful examples to us of those who run through the finish line well. Would you protect the decades in marriages among us? Would you guard our hearts and our affections such that our wholehearted devotion to you picks up pace the longer we live. And would you, by the power and the work of your spirit, would you give us grace to apply the principles that we see from Solomon's negative example in the nuances of our lives and our hearts this week so that we can repent and believe early and often and so that we can, like Paul, and like Jesus, say that we finished the race that was marked out for us. As we sing, as we love one another, as we encourage, would you embolden our confidence to walk faithfully in the path of life that you've marked out for us, for Christ's sake. Amen.